Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Veronica and uh, Anurag, for, um, uh, for, for, for organizing all this and for, uh, for inviting me um, to give um, this presentation. And, uh, well, I, uh, as Anurag said, I will be talking about chemical sensitivity in the X-ray X-ray uh, for an infrared out spectroscopy. Actually, there is an acronym one could use. Uh, people, I'm not sure if this is uh, established in the community yet, so, so maybe this um, it will stick. Uh, okay, so this is uh, what you do. You see here the the red from the beginning of the, the French Alps. This is where I work. I've been working for the for the past 15 years. Um, so this is I. Now the slides are very slow. There's um. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a tutorial a talk that I'm giving here. So the acknowledgements um, in, in principle should, should stretch uh, throughout my entire um, scientific career because I learned so much uh, from, from the colleagues and the people I've been working with. So, um, so I ask you um, to, to carefully uh, read and acknowledge the names that I put on the slides because many of the names there are <coughs> colleagues of mine that I have the pleasure of working with. So uh, this is part of the acknowledgements. The, um, citations and names I put on the slides. I think um, also my supervisors, and that uh, goes a little bit to my um, a scientific, uh, uh, yeah, my, my bi scientific biography. Uh, so I did my PhD with uh, Ben Sontag in photoelectron spectroscopy uh, on free metal atoms in, at Hamburg University. And then I moved to the group of Steve Kramer at the University of California at Davis. Um, and there I worked with Uwe, Uwe Bergman, who, who was at the time a postdoc and a scientist with, uh, with Steve Kramer. And this is where we did um, <coughs> photon in photon out spectroscopy, mainly on coordination chemistry and, uh, and biocatalysis. Uh, and then I did a postdoc with uh, Frank de Roth at uh, Utrecht University before then I, I joined um, the ISREF. And at the ISREF, uh, we are developing instrumentation and applications for photon in uh, photon out spectroscopy. And there I worked with many people and I'm grateful to everybody actually I, I, I worked with uh, at the ISREF and currently um, the members in the group are um, Blanca uh, and, and Sara, um, scientist Sara, Blanca, uh, human operation manager and uh, Nelly and uh, is a postdoc and Marius is a scientist working on a theoretical um, Uh, well, and of course, I think to show you now some books. I looked what uh, what uh, two days ago Jens uh, prepared. I think he proposed at least one of the books that I showed here as well. Um, Xaps for for everyone. There's another book by by Grant Hunter, Introduction to X-ray Absorption Fine Structure, which is very good for uh, very good introduction for an, an experimentalist. And uh, you can check those web pages. Ooh, I have to actually have to check if they're still up today. But there's the International X-ray Absorption Society. Ah, this is actually obsolete, I'm sorry. You should go to xas.org and, um, and have a look there. Um, there are books, uh, if you're interested, uh, well, this is recorded, so you can go back. Um, uh, so there's a book actually from the 89 already by, by Meisel. Uh, this shows a lot of um, photon in, photon out, uh, non-resonant emission spectra, um, and it explains the, the theory behind um, the spectra very nice. Then there's a review. Uh, by myself and, and Uwe. And uh, I think uh, next week there's a talk by Serena. Serena as well, she has very nice uh, many uh, review papers on, on photon in, uh, photon out spectroscopy. So uh, this is also on X-ray emission balance support, X-ray emission spectrum. Um, I will just briefly address X-ray Raman because I think it's nice uh, to, to those who have not heard about this to at least uh, know what, what can be done using this technique. And the godfather of this technique is, uh, is uh, Winfried Schulke, uh, and he wrote a book uh, in 2007, Electron Dynamics by Inelastic X-ray Scattering. Um, and then there's a review paper by uh, Jean-Pascal Rueff and Abel Schukla. Um, it is also a very nice, uh, very nice uh, review and um, accessible in the, to, the, to the experimenters as well. And then there are many talks. I saw Jens uh, <clears throat> advertised this uh, as well. Um, by organized by Jerry Seidler uh, in Washington State in Seattle, um, this the X-ray absorption journal, uh, journal club, and there are many videos on the board, uh, different people uh, also uh, introducing various techniques. 
Okay, so let's go to the beginning. Uh, I talk about X-ray emission or X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, um, which is actually um, the first technique if you compare X-ray absorption and emission spectroscopy. E emission was um, the technique that uh, was yeah, used first um, in order actually to establish the um, periodic table. I think there was an anniversary last year for the periodic table. And there's Henry Mosley who uh, realized that the um, X-ray emission lines um, are uh, the energies of the fluorescence lines. They depend on the atomic charge. And that was important because at the time, chemists maybe tried to figure out um, how the periodic table is organized by looking at the atomic mass, because that was possible and easy to do. But, um, um, but this was not uh, leading to the final conclusions and the final periodic table that we have now. So people, it, it, and the technique was required that is sensitive to the atomic charge. And X-ray, um, the K alpha lines, K beta lines, so the fluorescence lines, or X-ray emission lines, they are sensitive. The energies, this is shown here, so the energy relates, of course, to the wavelength and depends um, on the atomic charge. So that was very important. So X-ray fluorescence has been around um, for a long time and is actually now a little bit rediscovered at the various, uh, in the labs and the silicon radiation sources because of uh, improved um, instrumentation. So what can we do with X-ray spectroscopy? Um, I show here the uh, um, theoretical um, absorption edges and theoretical presence lines, no experimental data. This just comes from tables. Um, and uh, of course, it's element specific. That's very important. If you ever write a proposal for an X-ray spectroscopy beam line, um, you should say that you want to do spectroscopy because you need an element specific probe of um, the sample. And uh, not only absorption lines are, uh, have absorption edges that depend on the atomic number, but also then the emission lines um, that are sensitive to the atomic number. And of course, you do this because you would like to uh, obtain uh, information about the sample, so about the electronic structure and the atomic arrangements um, locally around an absorber atom. And this is information you uh, can look for and you can extract from the, um, from the X-ray spectrum. What is very important that uh, you can do this on samples with or without long range mode, right? So if you do the fraction, the fraction experiment, you need some kind of uh, long range order. And uh, um, this is not required in spectroscopy. Right? Um, and that's an important point. So if you have samples, for example, environmental sciences, you just want to put a piece of uh, soil and uh, see what the chemical state of uh, whatever is inside the soil, this, the, the soil is, um, you don't need the long range order. You can any, any um, amorphous or polycrystalline sample you can put into and get a spectrum out. Um, if you do hard X-ray spectroscopy, but also in the soft X-ray range, um, this technique is, uh, is bulk sensitive, especially in the hard X-ray range, bulk sensitive. And since the penetration is rather, penetration depth is rather large for the X-rays and fluorescence coming out, um, you can do um, in situ experiments, right? You can put your sample inside a cell with a window in front in order to keep a certain um, gas environment around the sample, heat the sample, and uh, so this can all be done. You can do high pressure experiments in, in mm -hmm. diamond envelope cells uh, because of the high penetration of the, of the X-rays. So this is all important for the justification why you would like to do um, X-ray spectroscopy. Okay, and what can I learn from X-ray spectroscopy? Here I group this into, if you do low energy resolution spectroscopy. So this is, uh, for those who know this, if you have a, like a germanium detector or anything, that's sitting next to your sample, you have an energy resolution uh, delta E of roughly 200, 150 electron volts, which is two orders of magnitude larger than the copper lifetime uh, gamma here. Um, if you do this kind of spectroscopy, so where the instrumental energy broadening is much larger than the copper lifetime broadening, um, then you can do an elemental analysis. Okay, that's an old technique, clear to everybody. But we would like to learn more, so we need high energy resolution spectroscopy, where the instrumental broadening is um, on the order of the core lifetime broadening, or even much smaller, in the milli electron volt um, range. Yeah, and this is shown here. So then, if you have this better resolution using um, crystal analyzers, for example, at the beamline, um, you resolve the, the fine structure of, in this case, the iron K alpha line. Um, and in this case, there are two different spin states of the iron in the sample, and you see there's a chemical sensitivity. Right? So the, the, the high spin system here 
in the, in the dashed line <clears throat> has a different shape, broader K, um, K alpha line um, in the low spin system. Yeah, so if you do it with higher resolution, suddenly you see the chemical dependence in the, um, the X-ray emission line. Um, what can you do? You can see the local atomic configuration with this technique. Uh, you learn about the electronic structure, uh, band structure, for example. You can learn about oxidation and spin states. You can characterize the chemical bond. You can identify your local coordination, the ligands, interatomic distances, bond angles, um, if possible. And you can learn about magnetic properties, right? There are techniques, um, in particular, uh, magnetic circular dichroism, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism that tells you about magnetic properties um, of your samples. So this is also possible. Um, then you can, if you do a time resolved, uh, I think what Jens showed uh, two days ago, you do a time resolved, then you learn about kinetics, for example. If you have very good resolution, for example, the inelastic X-ray scattering, you can also learn about um, a vibrational um, properties, um, molecules, for example, of moments and so on. So this is just a selection of what, uh, what you can learn in the uh, Before I move on, I just uh, would like to, to advertise um, a, a program here. So if you're interested in inertial spectroscopy, you can use um, a code here that was written um, by, um, so the user interface here was written by Marius Wettigan. Uh, here at the USREF, and that is based on a, on a code written by Maurits Haflekort, who is at the University of Heidelberg. Um, he wrote a code that is called Fonti, and um, that allows you to calculate um, inner shell spectra within the uh, ligand field multibed um, approach. Um, there is um, LHS of 3D transition methods, for example, is a prime application. Of this and it's uh, it's a very nice code. It's written in Python, so it's it's open uh, open source. Everybody can contribute and and see what what happens there. And you there are many different techniques now included in this code. Um, you can have different symmetries um, around your absorber atom um, and uh, the various um, yeah effects that you can include um, in order to model the chemical bond. Um, mixing of orbitals and ligand field effects. And it runs on all major operating systems. So if you're interested, just go to the web page. Have a look. It's also very educational, by the way. If you want to learn about ligand field multiplets, the effect of multiplet splitting, uh, if you're familiar with Tanabe Sobrano diagrams, things like this, you can all model this um, using this code. A few words to uh, clarify some expressions or, I don't know, yeah, terms that we use. What is the soft X-ray range? You can say roughly below. Um, X-ray energy is below 1,000 electron volts. And if you have energies higher than that, you can talk, call them hard X-rays. You see in this plot on the left, the attenuation length in, in manganese oxide. And you see it's uh, well below one micron in the soft X-ray range. Um, and then if you go into hard X-ray range, it goes to um, tens, uh, well, around 10, 10 microns. Here on the right, you see the transmission through air. Um, that's the, the dotted line there. So through air, one centimeter of air doesn't really that much of soft X-rays through. But in the hard X-ray range, um, I can leave my sample um, in, in gas and fine uh, problems. Um, the energy range between 1,000 and 5,000 electron volts has recently been named uh, the tender X-ray range shows that also scientists have a heart. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, I think it's generally accepted that you can express it. It's worth, yeah, it makes sense because um, in terms of instrumentation and absorption edge, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special energy range that um, has, for example, the, um, the K edge. of sulfur, chlorine, and phosphor that are important elements of X-ray spectroscopy, and why uh, it can show you something about the, the chemistry in your sample. Uh, for example, if you want to identify um, whether chromium is, um, is carcinogenic or not, uh, and it is carcinogenic if it's, uh, the oxidation state of chromium is 6, so it's hexavalent, um, then it's carcinogenic, and you would like to avoid this. Um, in 85, there, were still, there was still a lot of uh, chromium-6 produced in the world, uh, but now, at least in the European Union, it has been um, prohibited. Um, it was the topic, if some of you have seen this, um, the movie there, it's uh, with Julia Roberts fighting against a meme company who 
uh, dumped a lot of chromium-6 into, into, into the environment. Um, and you wonder, how can I find out whether a piece of soil has chromium-6 uh, or chromium-3? And the answer is you measure the absorption spectrum. Uh, you see here clearly, so this is the KHK absorption edge of chromium. Um, if you have chromium-6, you see this uh, strong line here, this pre peak um, coming up. If you have chromium-3, um, you don't see it. And the reason why the spectra are so different is because chromium-6 is four coordinated in a tetrahedral uh, local environment. So there's a chromium here um, in the center and the, the ligands around. And if it's chromium-3, you have uh, six ligands around in an octahedral geometry. Octahedral geometry is a higher geometry, has a higher symmetry than uh, the tetrahedral symmetry. You have uh, inversion symmetry. In this case, there's no inversion symmetry for a tetrahedral complex. And the inversion symmetry um, uh, prohibits uh, mixing of orbitals. In this case, it prohibits mi mixing of uh, P and D orbitals. In this case, mixing of P and D orbitals is allowed. And the mixing of the, of the P and D orbitals makes this pre edge peak here so strong. So in this case, the, the KH probes the, uh, the local geometry. And from the local geometry, we can deduce whether it's chromium 6 or chromium 3. Yeah, so this is a nice example I actually stole from the web page of John Bagat at, uh, at SSRL. Um, but it's a very nice example of um, how uh, X-ray spectroscopy can, can be used in environmental science. Another example here, this is local. This is uh, together with Alain So at the university here in, in Grenoble, who is an expert on uh, chemistry and mercury. And um, we measured the, uh, the L3 edge. Um, what that means, 2p two P, um, two P excitations in, uh, in mercury, and this is a sort of high resolution zanes, I'll explain later. And um, we looked at the, at the mercury LH, the mercury um, in human hair, and, um, and the mercury in the human hair ended up in the human hair either by uh, eating too much, uh, too much fish, tuna, swordfish, whatever, or by having your dental amalgam removed. Uh, then the dentist is not careful, the mercury in the amalgam goes into your body and ends up in your hair. And the question was, was can I distinguish between the mercury coming from the dental amalgam or from the, from the fish? And then you measure the absorption edge and you, um, you see the spectral difference here. Below here, you see actually on a on measured at uh, ESF ID21 um, and with a microscope, an X-ray microscope, if you scan along the hair in this direction, and suddenly you see the spike here, that means you can calculate back when the dentist removed the amalgam from your, from your hair, because then yeah, this is when you put the, the mercury in your body and then the hair grows and then at a certain point in your hair, you find it again. It is very low concentration. This is uh, also in the, in the parts per million, uh, parts per million, sorry, parts per million, in the low parts per million PPM uh, range, and you measure those data. And the, the point here is that um, the, the local coordination, so these are proposals how uh, mercury is coordinated um, if, you, if it ends up in your hair after fish consumption and if it ends up in your hair after having your dental amalgam removed. And you see that the, the coordination is different in the two cases. And this can be done by, so the assignment between the structure and the, can, the spectral shape is, a, is in this case done by measuring many, many, many model compounds and uh, calculations, the theoretical calculations of first structure optimizations and then the structures inserted into a, a theoretical code, in this case, the, um, the FDMDS code by EJV. And, and this then leads to this assignment of the, of the spectral features to the two um, complexes here. Okay, so this was a, a good motivation. And now I would like to explain to you some basics. It will get a little mathematical, I hope it's not too too heavy, but uh, I think it's useful in order to understand the, the, the background, the basics of, um, of X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so first, an, an, an overview of the different things that, uh, that people like to measure in X-ray spectroscopy. So I show here um, a one electron diagram of various transitions in, in a 3D transition metal. Um, so this is the, uh, the Fermi energy, so you have uh, all those levels here populated and the Fermi energy, they're not populated. If you excite from a, from a 1s or 2p shell, you can excite your electron either to the continuum, 
or you can excite into an unoccupied orbital just above the Fermi energy. So this could be a resonant excitation, that could be a non-resonant excitation. Um, what you can do now, if you, uh, you can measure, for example, the, the kinetic energy, of course, of your photoelectron, and then you do photoelectron spectroscopy. This is particularly interesting if you go here to the right and, uh, and photo excite an electron from the um, from occupied uh, valence orbital and then measure the kinetic energy. Then you get um, the, the, the spectrum here. So that could be photoelectron um, spectroscopy of your, of your valence shell. Um, you can do this also, of course, of any uh, core level. So that's photoelectron spectroscopy. Um, well, after following the, the creation of a core hole vacancy, so you create one as a, or two big hole, um, this hole is then filled uh, either from the 2P shell, 3P shell, or from a, a valence shell. Then you call it K alpha, K beta, or valence to core X ray emission lines, X ray emission spectroscopy. Yeah? In this case, since the, the photo excited electron is still there, high up there, in its photoionized state, this would be called a non resonant emission spectroscopy. Uh, if you do this following a resonant excitation, you would call this um, resonant um, emission spectroscopy. This is in principle resonant inner X phase scattering. It's all the same thing, theoretically. Um, yeah, so you can call it resonant XCS or resonant inner X phase scattering. Um, and then, of course, there are show OJ decay here as well. Most of you know this. And this can be called a resonant valence core. Okay, um, if you do this in the hard X-ray range, the, the X-ray absorption spectrum, if you excite from a 1S electron, would be the blue line here in manganese. And the valence to core, this line here would be the, the green line here. Yeah, just to explain to you, to show to you, so this probes the unoccupied uh, orbitals and this probes um, occupied orbitals, right? <coughs> the final thing here in reverse photomission, I'm not explaining now, you can, you can look it up. Okay, um, this is uh, the, uh, yeah, also I would like to, another point that is important to me um, in order to, to yeah, better understand the things that I'm showing, that I'm showing now uh, on the following slides. So I showed you now the transitions here in the so-called, I call this one electron diagram, right? We showed the energy uh, of the Fermi level here and we excited one S, S electron into the continuum. So I showed the the levels of the of the orbitals, the energy levels in a qualitative scheme um, of the orbitals here, Fermi energy and anode. Okay, we discussed this before. Um, I can show exactly the same thing in the so-called many-body diagram uh, that observes the energy conservation, neglecting the energy of the, of the of the photon, but the energy of the of all electrons in the system that is important. So that means the, the non-resonant excitation here. I show like this, the ground state is described by all electrons in my system. So it's not a single shell, it's the energy of, uh, um, of all electrons and protons and everything included in my system. Yeah? And uh, I go from this into, into this state and I have a, a photoelectron um, excited here. That would be the resonant excitation where I excite a 1s electron into a 3d orbital and I reach a configuration 1s1, 3d n plus 1. Um, yeah, so again, this is a multi-electron description of this, uh, of this excited state that I reach after this resonant excitation. And if I now want to describe my, my K-beta uh, lines, I reach, um, in this case, this is a non-resonant K-beta line, I will replace one S hole with a 3P hole, um, and this electron just stays up there. So this, this is this uh, red electron there, it just stays in its um, epsilon P um, state. Or orbital, and uh, and then the resonant the resonant uh, emission. Um, so this is the case uh, shown here with the excited electron staying in the resonant shell. Um, this goes down to this state there. And so this is then the one, one many electron many body description um, of the same process. Uh, this has many advantages um, because, uh, as I said, it observes energy conservation, and um, it, it's a, a more useful way of describing. Um, your transitions and it's easier to show um, the, the two-step process here. Okay, so how do we how do we calculate this? Um, so again, this is the total energy diagram I go from the ground state and the excited state, and the energies of those states are calculated using the Schrödinger equation that is shown here, and which is then put into some codes, can be a DFT code or any um, code that gives you then the energy of those um, of those states. And um, 
if I now want to calculate the spectral intensities, I have to calculate the so-called transition matrix element. So I have the wave function with all electrons included um, in the ground state. I have an operator here that uh, represents the interaction of my, um, of my X-rays with, with, the, with the electrons in the sample. And this is the excited state. Yeah, this is the transition matrix element. I take the square in order to get the intensity. Then I do, uh, an, um, then I do an approximation. So I want to get rid of all electrons that do not take part um, in the transition. They will still somehow affect um, the spectral intensity because they will rearrange um, as a response to the photo excitation. So now I have one electron orbitals here. So this could be 1s and this could be 2p, 3d, depending on what element you look at. And I simplify the photon operator to the so-called dipole operator. And uh, the effect of all other electrons that rearrange is just lumped together in this vacuum. Okay, and this is the same thing written. So this is just the short form, the, the Dirac notation, and this is then you just what you have to do is solve an integral of the dipole operator. Yeah. Here down here, just for your reference, I show how the, the excitation operator here or the operator that represents the photon can be rewritten or approximated in the dipole term and the particle term. Okay, so this is what uh, what is calculated in order to calculate the or determine the spectral intensities. Um, in most cases, so it's a, it's, a, it's a dipole transition between one orbital, for example, 2p, into a 3d orbital for the edge of a, of a 3d transition. Okay. Um, let's go uh, take a step back and go back in history. So how was absorption described uh, in 1792? Uh, the bayer lambert law, which is a kind of an empirical law that shows that the intensity um, after a sample is reduced uh, compared to the intensity before the sample by this um, exponential factor. And uh, the tau here, I can then uh, describe in more detail by the, what I put everything there, by the um, particle density. And here, this is then the atomic cross-section of the um, homogeneous sample of the atoms um, in, the, in the sample. I think it's a little bit more complicated if you have a heterogeneous sample, several elements um, in the sample, it's just the sum over the cross sections um, of the different elements in the sample. And, uh, and this considers inhomogeneity along the, the travel direction. Yeah, so but the point is here, so, the, uh, so this is kind of the, the empirical observation and you relate this empirical observation to an, a cross section, right? An atomic cross section of the element in question, okay? And this is actually the thing that contains, so it's a function of energy, and this contains uh, ultimately the chemical information um, that we're looking for, right? So we want to describe this uh, or measure this in our experiment. Um, so this was now uh, what the status of, uh, let's say, 1792. If you now go to modern uh, quantum, mechani quantum mechanical description um, of the process, we, uh, um, it looks like this. So you describe your incoming photon the, uh, with the, its energy, the wave uh, vector, and the polarization. We do the same with the outcoming photon. Uh, energy, wave vector, and polarization. And, uh, and then you have the incoming and outcoming shown here. And then you have an angle between the incoming and uh, outgoing uh, photon, which is the scattering angle. And between the two um, photons, incoming and outgoing photons, you, you can uh, define uh, a momentum transfer. Q. Okay, and then there's a lot of uh, quantum mechanics done. Obviously, I don't want to go into details there. Just say that the, uh, the photon here is described by a vector field. Uh, this is the plane wave just traveling in this direction. Um, and this is the, um, yeah, so this is the vector field A that describes the photon. And we, should, we will see then uh, in the next slide that I can distinguish the spectroscopies that I do. Um, I can distinguish, um, what, how A is treated in the perturbation theory. So this uh, vector field perturbs the electrons in the, um, in the sample. Um, and this is quantum mechanically treated using perturbation theory. And then there are several orders of perturbation theory. There's the first order and the second order. In the first order, I have an A square term. In the second order, I have an A dot P term. Um, yeah, so what is important here, just I have a first order term and a second order term where this A appears differently. A little side remark that uh, if you want to relate the cross-section that I um, 
mentioned before for the total absorption, there's a so-called optical theorem that relates the absorption cross-section to the um, elastic forward scattering in the sample. So forward scattering means theta equals zero. Um, okay. Yeah, so the principle in this situation is well. And I have actually the next slide, I have questions. Yeah. Questions? Okay, Peter. Yes, there might be some connection issues today, but um, if anyone in the audience has a question, this is the time for. Or... Okay. We... Doesn't seem so. Usually they wait to the end, yeah. <laughs> according to our experience. <laughs> okay, so I so what I I go back to the um, yeah. So the, that is important. Now you have uh, you 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 describe the interactions of your X-rays with the sample in two uh, in using the quantum mechanical perturbation theory. Then you have a first order term and a second order term. And they are so-called diagrams. You obviously don't have to understand the details, but I just want to show you that the so-called first order terms, and this is your sample and this is your photon coming. Um, here they interact. In this case, the photon comes out and your sample goes in a different state. In this case, this is the so-called A-square term. And if you go in, a, in the so-called second order term, P dot A, this is your sample and this is your photon. And here the photon is absorbed. And there's kind of a photonless intermediate state, and then the photon goes out and the sample continues. Okay. This A square term, just to make the, the link, this A square term, the formula here is, uh, is not so uh, just for your information. But um, what is important here is that uh, there's a dot product between your incoming and outgoing, outgoing light. Uh, this dot product gives an angular dependence to the um, um, to the intensity here. And uh, there's elastic scattering, Compton or Bragg scattering is elastic, and Raman scattering or Compton scattering are so-called inelastic terms. Okay. Um, and here, this is the what I explained before. So this is the, the, the wave, um, the, the momentum transfer, which is the difference between the incoming and outgoing um, wave vector. Okay. And the operator here, so this is again the ground state and the final state, and what is connect, what connects the two ground and final states is the transition operator. And the transition operator contains this momentum transfer Q. So that's very interesting because that uh, if you think of selection rules that determine this transition here, the, um, the momentum transfer Q influences the selection rules for your, for your transitions. And using this, you can do uh, spectroscopy, I'll skip the angular dependence. Um, you can do spectroscopy, and it's very interesting. It's called X-ray Raman um, spectroscopy. I show again here the, um, the, the matrix element that you have to calculate in order to, um, to obtain your spectra. This is the study by uh, Siomo Watari and at Helsinki, uh, who has very nice papers there um, that explain this Raman scattering. So what you see here, this is the um, this is the Compton peak, the broad line here. So this is measured, I think, at roughly 10,000 um, 10, electron volts incoming energy. And uh, if you change your uh, momentum transfer, um, you see how the Compton um, peak changes. Uh, this, is, this is well known. And what is nice that you see here something like an absorption edge. So in this case, CMO scattered 10 keV uh, photons from a diamond um, sample um, and changed then, in principle, changed the scattering angle. And that changes the Q. The Compton peak moves around, but this line here does not change. It stays at a fixed energy transfer. So it's an energy that is transferred from the 10,000 electron volt um, incoming beam. It transfers roughly 300 electron volts to the sample. And uh, at this 300 electron volts, I see um, an absorption edge. I see the carbon K edge that I usually can only observe using soft X-rays. So I could do absorption spectroscopy at the carbon K edge directly at 300 electron volts. Um, but uh, using this X-ray Raman scattering technique, I can observe the carbon K edge by going into with 10,000 electron volts and look at an energy transfer. So I look at uh, outgoing X-rays uh, with 9,700 electron volts. Um, so this is called X-ray Raman spectroscopy. So it allows to study low Z elements using hard X-rays. 
And this is interesting if you want to do research in batteries, for example, um, where in this case, look again, you look at the carbon um, in, in, in this battery, um, a setup, so this is an in situ experiment, so you see there are several windows, there's a graphite electrode, separators, and the lithium counter, counter electrode, and, uh, and different voltages are applied, and the carbon in the side of the sample changes depending on the voltage, and I can nicely measure in situ um, the changes of the, of the carbon chemical environment using this X-ray environment samples. Yeah, again, so this is here the energy loss. So this experiment, I don't know exactly the details, publication references here. The experiment was done um, at, again, roughly 10,000 um, electron volts or several KeV. Yeah, so this is a very interesting technique. This is the X-ray Rama technique. Are there any questions? If not... Uh, we have questions, actually. As I said, uh, they come later. So one question is, which X-ray spectroscopy is more suitable in case uh, if we have barium and cobalt together in our sample, having nearly the same binding energy. But, but barium, cobalt, barium and cobalt? Yes. yes. Yeah, but they, they, are, they can easily distinguish them. Uh, the absorption edges, I think you should, you should be able to distinguish them. If you have problems with it, that's a long question. And if you have problems with excess ranges, um, then I don't know exactly what the the copper is nine point something barium. If you have problems with exafs uh, spectroscopy and edges coming up, that's a different topic. That's a long topic. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there are others. So maybe we take another one and then you can continue. Okay. Right? Good. So what should be the minimum sample volume for those techniques? The minimum sample volume is uh, it, it, it depends. In principle, the beams are very small. You have microns or even nano beams, right? That, that would be your mm -hmm. sample volume. The problem is that you probably fry your sample with small beams. If your sample, yeah, the, the volume that you need to do your spectroscopy is very small. Right? It can be in the, in the, micron, in the micron range. But uh, if you fry, if you burn, if you damage your sample with the X-rays, you need a lot of sample. Because then in order to get your spectrum out, you have to change your sample many times. So you have to move your beam on the sample. But the beams can be much smaller than neutrons. Neutrons need larger samples. X-rays can work with very small, small beams. Okay, then I, I think you can continue because the time is running out, so it's 2.40. Okay, so, so let's go now to the, to the second part of this interaction. So this P dot A is what uh, most of the spectroscopists are interested in. Again, so these are your, your scattering and diffraction experiments are this term there. And Raman spectroscopy is a special case of an inelastic X-ray scattering experiment. And this is what most of us spectroscopists are interested in. And uh, so what you do if you do photon in, photon out spectroscopy, again in this total energy diagram that I explained before, you start with the ground state, um, you calculate you have a certain probability to reach intermediate state, and you have a certain probability to reach a final state. Okay? And this can be calculated with the Thomas Heisenberg equation here. I, I'm not going into detail. Um, what is interesting, you can vary the, um, the so-called energy transfer, right? If you, if you have a high energy transfer, you have a corpel in the final state as well, a shallower corpel than in the, in the ground state, uh, I'm sorry, in, than in the intermediate state, and you can reduce your energy transfer, and then you see actually very small energy uh, excitations, and then actually your X-ray spectroscopy probes states that are similar to your optical And that I show here. So if you do um, another electron 3D goes out down to the P, that would be a rather large energy transfer. Um, if you have a, tra um, a transition in the second step from the valence orbital down to the uh, cobalt that you created before, the 2P cobalt, then you have a net excitation that looks like you excited an electron from the valence orbital to, the, um, to an unoccupied orbital there. And this looks uh, like an an excitation that you can observe in optical spectroscopy with a UV vis spectrometer, for example, in your lab, or even a Raman spectrometer um, in your lab. Yeah, so you can have using X rays, you can reach um, excitations that are usually only observable um, 
using optical means uh, in the lab. If you do it resonantly, then you observe this excitation element selectively. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah. yeah, there's another way of showing this. Um, so if I go with the X-rays in, then X-rays out, and I have an energy transfer, and this small energy transfer allows me to observe vibrations and the valence shift, for example, in my inelastic X-ray scaling experiments. Okay. Um, another way of showing this is just an overview, so you can. Uh, you can, you can study using this inelastic X-ray scattering by reducing the energy transfer. You can see, you can see phonons, you can see crystal field interactions, you can study your charge transfer excitations. And if you go higher energies, uh, higher energy transfers, um, you see then um, the core levels in your inelastic scattering process. Okay, now I give you an example for, for serum dioxide uh, to see how this works. So excite 2P um, to 3D. Uh, to 5D in this case, so um, cerium is a, is, a, is a rare earth, 5D levels are unoccupied. So if you measure an LH spectrum, we excite 2P to 5D, and then you can observe a 3D electron going down um, to 2P. The second order process has to be described with this Kramers Heisenberg equation that I showed you before. Now I analyze the not only the incoming um, energy, but also the scattered energy, or the fluorescence energy. And I get two spectra, this spectrum and this spectrum. I can combine the two spectra and I get the so-called Riggs plane. With the energy of the incoming beam shown here or the energy of the outgoing X-rays shown here. So I scan both monochromators and get a two-dimensional intensity distribution. What I can do now, I can take a diagonal cut to my um, to this um, uh, two-dimensional energy distribution and I get this red line here, which is called a high energy resolution fluorescence detected X-ray absorption spectrum, and I can, com can compare this to a conventional absorption spectrum. Yeah, that I would measure, for example, in transmission mode or total fluorescence. Mode. Yeah, and you see that this diagonal cut, so this um, kind of Riggs technique, allows you to improve your spectral resolution enormously. Yeah, so I see I get a spectral a spectral broadening in principle that is not limited anymore by the lifetime broadening of my integral scale. Okay, and uh, this shows again, so you have a 2P hole in the, this is intermediate state, a 3D hole in the so-called final state. You see this in orbit splitting of the 3D levels here. And again, you see this uh, broadening that I showed before. It was done a long time ago, actually, by K.O. Hemmerlein already on this prosium in 91. So I just explained to you here why, uh, where this um, spectral broadening, uh, broadening comes from. And the spectral broadening comes from that your, your lifetime broadening of the intermediate state uh, is stretches in this direction, lifetime broadening of the final state in this direction. And uh, I can do a cut through this Riggs plane um, at 45 degrees um, relative to those broadenings. And that, that gives me the spectral sharpening. And this has been used, another example here by Alain Monceau, I'll just uh, show you what, what can be done there on Mercury. The, the gray line here is the, um, um, the conventional spectrum that you measure in conventional absorption spectroscopy. Um, and the blue lines here, they show you the high resolution data. Yeah, using the crystal analyzer spectrometer in order to analyze high resolution, the fluorescence coming out. And you see the, um, um, how, you, how, can, how you can nicely distinguish in the high resolution data between different coordinations of the mercury in this case. So if you have linear coordination, you get this strong um, edge peak. Um, and if you um, have this six coordination, it becomes weaker, and it becomes even weaker if you have a tetrahedral coordination. Yeah. So it's similar to the chromium, um, the edge um, spectral shape, highly resolved, uh, allows you to identify the local coordination of the mercury um, in the system. Another example here, just to um, for you can also do this in the tender X-ray range. So this is uranium. This is the M4 edge um, of uranium. If you measure it conventionally, you get the red lines here. If you measure high resolution, you see you can suddenly um, resolve all these fine structures. These are the same samples, low resolution, high resolution. And this really allows you to distinguish uh, in mixed halon compounds. So you have uranium-4 uranium and uranium-5. You can distinguish between the two um, in the high resolution data. So this is a work by uh, Christina Kuchmina. Um, and this is actually a hot topic these days. So many people want to do um, images uh, in actinides using this uh, high resolution uh, method um, because it really allows you to obtain much more chemical information about the sample than conventional absorption spectroscopy. Um, 
Are there questions? Uh, yes, so we have a question of how, how to see the changes in a molecule with the different ligands and how do we know which one is causing those changes? Which, which ligand is causing those changes? Well, I, have a, I can show you a slide if you, how, you want to see how you can identify a ligand. Yes, it says how to see the changes in a molecule with the different ligands. How to change? So there, ligand identification is a don't, big topic of ligand identification. In, in principle, there's exas. Um, there's a lot of literature on exas on the net. Um, and if you have ligands with very different atomic numbers, um, so if, for example, if you have uh, a metal ion that has usually only oxygen ligands, and suddenly one or in the higher coordination shell there is another metal ion, you should see this metal ion in the exas. Um, Exas has the limit. Exas is not able to distinguish between um, ligands that are very similar in their atomic numbers. And if you want, I can show you quickly. Uh, actually, the okay, we need to yeah, yeah, just continue on because I. I, I I show you, I show you, I think that answers the question. So in this venous, venous core X-ray emission spectroscopy, you, uh, you, you see those uh, transitions here, um, and their transitions, they relate to the binding, to, uh, the binding energy of the 2S electron on the ligand. Um, and this venous core emission spectroscopy uh, allows you to identify um, the ligand um, of the India, the ligand. And, and maybe Serena next week, she will talk more about valence core emission spectroscopy. So if the question is, how can I identify ligands, you can use this uh, valence core X-ray emission spectroscopy. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for your answer. We have 10 minutes left. So I ask, maybe I ask you to continue with your talk and then we leave the few, maybe a couple of questions for the end, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, how, how, how much longer do you want me to talk? Want me to talk? Uh, just for me to know. To... I so mean, then... if, if, I... You, if, you're, if you're done, then we can continue with the questions. Uh, if you have a couple of slides to, to show just, us. Then I, I, I just, uh, well, I'm, I'm through. this is the last thing that I showed. Maybe then I explain it a little bit, uh, a little bit better because I, I uh... yeah, so the, um, the, the valence the core emission lines, they come from, from, uh, from mixed orbitals. So they're, they're orbitals um, where the, this is the metal ion here in the, in the, in the center and the, the, the orbitals, 3D orbitals, also P orbitals, um, on this metal ion they form together with the ligand orbitals. So these are six ligands around and these are two P orbitals on the ligand. They form molecular orbitals that are composed, in like in a linear combination of atomic orbitals, they're composed of the metal orbitals and the ligand orbitals. Yeah? And this can happen for, um, by mixing the 2P, ligand 2P orbitals with the metal orbitals, or the ligand 2S orbitals with the, with the metal orbitals. So this valence to core emission lines, they arise from occupied orbitals that are mixed orbitals between the metal valence orbitals and the ligand orbitals. And that makes those valence to core emission lines sensitive to the ligand environment. Yeah? Um, and that's why this, the, the line here comes with the X. So this, the, these lines here, they are um, arise from molecular orbitals that are mainly composed of the ligand 2S orbitals. And that's why the energy of this line that I observe in my spectroscopy relates to the binding energy of the 2S electron. Yeah, so this allows me to identify the ligands. And it goes, you can compare this, by the way, the valence to core X-ray emission lines, they reach formally the same electronic final states as valence, bar valence band UPS, I showed at the beginning. Right? Um, so you can compare the chromium oxide. So this shape here, you would have to compare to the chromium oxide here, which is the red line there. So only the, the, this line there. Yeah. So in principle, it probes the same part of your of your electronic structure, but different selection rules, different energy resolution, so the spectra look different. This technique is element selective. Valence band UPS is a priori if it's not done resonantly, not um, element selective. Yeah. This is done under, usually under ultra-high vacuum condition. 
This is done X-ray emission spectroscopy in any kind of uh, environment that you want. Just use hard X-rays that are compatible with any kind of uh, X-ray environment. Yeah, and uh, we use this there, in for, for example, to identify in electroplated uh, samples, to what extent I have metallic chromium or chromium carbide. Um, you can calculate those spectra very nicely using the Ceph code, for example. If anybody's familiar with the Ceph code, you can calculate the spectra. It comes out quite nicely, and you see the, the difference between the chromium, metallic chromium, and chromium carbide just by looking at the carbon um, to, S, um, to SPT in the X-ray emission data. Okay, so this is a very nice tool to identify your living environment. It goes further. You can even uh, see this in model calculations done by Gregory Smolensev, who is now at the PSI. Um, if you have a hypothetical system of, um, of manganese in the center here and the six water molecules around, you, uh, you can see or you can detect in the spectra whether one of the six water molecules is missing one proton. Yeah? So if I replace a water molecule with a, with a hydroxide, then this shows up in the spectrum. Why? Because if I remove the proton, the binding energy of the 2s electron in this oxygen here will change. Yeah? And I can assign actually this molecular, molecular orbital that is mainly localized in this oxygen there has a different binding energy and then thus a different fluorescence energy than, um, than the water molecule that is here on the other side. So on the other side, I still have water with two protons and the energy is different. Yeah, so the bottom line here is that this technique allows you to um, identify the degree of ligand protonation um, in your sample. Yeah, but the, 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 the reasoning, the chemical sensitivity is always the same. Yeah, I, I look at the fluorescence line that is um, sensitive to the, um, to the ligand environment. Um, yeah, that's sensitive and then to the binding energy of your, of your ligand uh, molecules. And with this, uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. We continue with some more questions before the end of this webinar. So one of them is how flexible is the technique instruments? Can I measure thermal excited reactions? Yeah, this is, this is um, it's, it's hard x-rays or even tender x-rays. You can easily build an in situ cell. So you can heat up your cell up to easily up to a thousand degrees. Uh, your sample, you can go even higher. People do experiments in extreme conditions, right? In order to simulate the conditions inside the earth or even on planets and the universe. Um, so people with, you know, elaborate setups, laser heating, and then you can go to very high temperatures and very high pressures. Oh. Um, yeah, so very, yeah, all kinds of sample or in conditions for the sample are possible. Great, so we have the last question then because time is running out. So at the start you said uh, about, you said something about sample damage. So how to address the sample damage? Yeah, that is a, that is a, a long topic and a very important topic. Um, you well, only have two minutes. <laughs> I only have two minutes, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, because, yeah, so damage, every sample you put in the beam, you should check for damage, yeah. If it damages under the beam, you have to think of a new experimental protocol. You have to change, you have to move the beam over your sample or change the sample many times. Um, what you should do, you should calculate, uh, somehow estimate um, how much, um, how many photons can I get out of my sample before it's completely damaged. And then you can calculate whether the experiment is possible or not. It may be, if your sample damages under the beam, you need a lot of sample. If the amount of sample that you have available is limited, your experiment may not be feasible. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, you can try to cool down your sample. You can put your sample into vacuum. There's, uh, there are certain mitigation methods. Um, you can try this, and usually or most beamlands around the world, they all experience and they try all this. Uh, sometimes even cooling down your sample 